leads to this very call today. Our main goal for this special CAN update is to provide a basic overview of the process related to the allocation of the American Rescue Plan, or ARP for short, funds here in North Carolina. In addition, we hope to provide some ideas of ways advocates can have an impact on this process by working together on some key priorities. And that is exactly why we want to hear from you. So please take a second today to complete the ARP appropriation survey. We will have that link in the chat box um, during this call. So with that being said, we are thrilled to be joined today by an expert panel including Susie Kachaturian, Policy Analyst for the North Carolina Budget and Tax Center, Matt Gross, Assistant Secretary for Government Affairs for NCDHHS, Vicki Cruz, Policy Analyst and Kids Count Program Director here at NC Child, and Elizabeth Byram, Campaign Specialist also here at NC Child. Susie will begin things by providing an overview of the process related to ARP funds and other key insights. Matt will be sharing some highlights of Governor Cooper's proposal to allocate ARP funds and what Governor Cooper says is, quote, a once in a generation opportunity to invest in North Carolina and ensure a shared recovery from the global pandemic. Vicki will talk about a historic opportunity related to lead mitigation and how, how that ties into ARP funds designated for North Carolina. And last but not least, Elizabeth will then share recommendations from NC Child related to how early education funds available through the American Rescue Plan could be allocated here in our state uh, for our children and set them on a stronger path to succeed. And remember, during the presentations, feel free to use the chat box should you have any questions or comments. And after all the presenters have gone through, we will have time to answer questions, hopefully. So let's get started. So Susie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Tiffany. So I just put a link in the chat to um, a Google Doc that I don't necessarily want you looking at while I'm presenting, but um, just wanted to be sure to share that sooner rather than later because um, I only have four, uh, 15, I think I have about 15 minutes. Tiffany, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I have a lot to get through. So yes. And um, Susie, I'm your timekeeper. So I will. So if I interrupt you, don't take it personally. <laughs> yes. No, please, please do. Um, and I also can't see the chat while I'm talking. So yeah, feel free to interrupt me if anything goes awry. Um, alrighty, so yeah, so I have 15 minutes to get through a lot of content, um, but I have many resources in addition to the Google Doc that I shared in the chat. Um, and we also have many that are in the works as all this work continues. So um, what I, here's an overview of what I'll talk about today. I'll kind of give an overview of what was in the American Rescue Plan how it will impact North Carolina, um, and then jump into a bit more about um, process, um, guidance from US Treasury, as well as um, a timeline and sort of connecting that to broader budget work and legislative work. Um, so just to kind of step back, um, I'm sure we all know at this point that the American Rescue Plan Act uh, which is kind of an awkward name, <laughs> I always thought. Um, it was signed into law on March 11th by President Biden, but it was really the sixth major um, federal COVID-19 relief act. Um, so on the left here on this slide, you can see this graphical representation of an analysis that I published um, last April, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, summarizing most but not all of um, the relief coming to North Carolina from the first three bills on this list. Um, so up until the CARES Act, which of course was, um, was really the, um, the big act that um, the North Carolina General Assembly focused a lot of its legislative work on last year and of course agencies as well. Um, and so I'm currently working on something similar to this, it's called the Sankey Graph. Um, specifically around the American Rescue Plan, but um, a lot of what we know about um, the plan is in that Google Doc that I shared, although it, um, it needs some updating at this point. So we'll do that in the next few days. Um, 
So again, as you well know, just to kind of level set, uh, the American Rescue Plan provides support across many different issue areas that are sort of summarized here. I'll go into a bit more detail about it, um, but I just love this graphic from um, our national partners at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Um, we've also likely heard that the rescue plan is expected to um, have dramatic, lead to dramatic reductions in poverty and especially child poverty. So um, the national estimate is that the American Rescue Plan will cut poverty by about 40%. And when we sort of translate that into what it means for North Carolina, it would mean that about 500,000 or half a million North Carolinians would be boosted above the very meager federal poverty threshold of 26,500 for a family of four. So kind of the two key ways that we're thinking about the American Rescue Plan um, and how it can move us through COVID-19 response and into recovery is through direct aid to people and through providing investments um, for public institutions. So we know that um, supports to help people directly matters for you know, keeping people housed, keeping people fed, providing cash. Um, to individuals um, and families to make ends meet like today um, and over the coming weeks um, is really critical and frankly was long overdue. Um, but we also know that a more sustained response is critical to sort of build back our public institutions. And I think that's especially true in North Carolina and something we, we think a lot about at the Budget and Tax Center. Um, so I'll talk about each of these kind of two big categories um, moving forward. So in terms of direct supports to people, here are some of the programs that we've identified, but this is not a comprehensive list. Um, so you'll notice that some of these programs are administered by state agencies under federal guidance, and that includes um, the rental and homeowner assistance, as well as um, some of the food assistance provision. So um, some of these are like categories like healthcare and food assistance, whereas others are specific programs. Um, but you'll probably also note that um, several of these programs are administered through the tax code. So on that note, um, the three sort of key, um, key ways to get cash to family um, that came through the American Rescue Plan are through um, the economic impact payments, also known as the stimulus checks um, that you know, many, many people saw direct deposited into their bank accounts, um, the earned income tax credit or EITC expansion, as well as the child tax credit or CTC expansion. Um, the website that I've included here, findyourfunds.org, is something that was just launched this week by some of our legal service partners in Massachusetts. Um, so um, it's probably one of the best public facing um, websites that I've seen so far. Um, I think the information is pretty accessible if you know folks are um, in different situations and don't know what they need to do to, to get these funds. Um, I will say that my one <laughs> qualm with it is that um, it kind of emphasizes um, ways that folks can pay to get tax assistance. And we know that there are also ways to get free and good resources. And by good, I really mean, um, you know, trustworthy, accurate, IRS certified ways to get tax assistance um, through online software and through um, VITA sites and their income requirements to be able to access those. But and that, that's all. Um, described in that, that website and others. Um, I also have some other resources that I can share um, if any follow-up materials are being sent around um, immigrant eligibility for the third set of stimulus payments, which is different than the prior two stimulus payments. Um, so just briefly for the sake of time, with respect to what you all can do as advocates and or direct service providers or just in your communities, is to get information out to people about um, eligibility and especially what action is necessary of them. Um, so even though tax day, uh, which this year was May 17th, um, even though tax day has passed, you can still file your taxes anytime without a penalty if you are owed a refund. 
So for the people who are least likely to get um, these, uh, these direct payments or these tax credits um, because their income is low enough that they don't need to file, um, those are especially the folks that, um, that should be filing now, even though tax day has passed. Um, and so ensuring that people, especially those vulnerable um, economically and socially um, is ongoing work. And of course, documenting the benefits that these um, tax credits have, um, especially given the North Carolina um, did away with our EITC, our state EITC many years ago in our advocacy work around trying to get that um, reinstated. So in kind of shifting to the public investments uh, or the, yeah, the public investments, public infrastructure aspect of the American Rescue Plan, um, here's just a very, very high level summary of um, what's called the uh, state and local fiscal recovery funds. And so you'll see that there's a significant amount of money going to the state, $5.4 billion. Um, half of it is coming this year and half of it is coming next year. Um, I'll talk more about that. There's a whole host of um, issue specific funding that you will see a bit more about on the next slide. Um, many of those um, funding streams, if not all of the funding streams are going to state agencies to then pass on to local governments and local communities. Um, in addition to that, there is $3.4 billion going to uh, metropolitan cities, all 100 counties in North Carolina, as well as other um, governments, including towns. Um, so here are some of the issue specific funding areas that I mentioned. Again, some of these are just like big categories like childcare, as many of you I'm sure know, has two primary funding streams. Um, transportation has a, a host of funding streams. Healthcare is a big category. There's the Medicaid expansion incentive that I know um, a lot of you all are working on. Um, and these are all described in the, the Google doc that I shared earlier. So um, there is a, you know, trying to um, guide the General Assembly on how to spend $5.4 billion comes with a lot of advocacy opportunities. Um, and so just these are really, really broad, but engaging with, um, because a lot of the issue specific funding, in addition to a lot of the other state funding is going to state agencies, um, engaging with the state agencies around priorities for where funding should be um, directed to as well as aligning funding streams to support um, long standing systems that have um, been underinvested in North Carolina, as well as addressing systemic barriers um, are again like really, really high level, but um, really important for us to think about as advocates for those of us that are advocates. So kind of, I'm gonna spend a, um, maybe a minute just quickly going over what was in the um, US Treasury guidance. And um, this content is all literally copied and pasted from a fact sheet that I just created. Um, so I can also share that um, uh, after my presentation. So the state and local fiscal recovery funds, again, this is the 5.4 billion that's going to the state and the 3.4 billion that is going to various local governments in North Carolina. Um, those dollars must be allocated by the end of 2024 and spent by the end of 2026. There is really, really broad guidance. Um, there are examples in treasury guidance about um, you know, how examples of um, how funding can be used within these broad categories that are listed here on the slide. There's also um, a handful of restrictions on funding that um, we will, in particular will be focusing on at the Budget and Tax Center. So making sure that um, funds are not put into our state savings reserve, which is often called the rainy day fund. We can't use the money to pay off debts or deposit into pension funds. We cannot have new net tax cuts to um, state tax revenue, um, or that will result in an equivalent reduction in the federal recovery funds. Touch more on that in a moment. Um, and then the funds, uh, the funds can be used for infrastructure, but it is limited to 
broadband water and sewer infrastructure it cannot be used for general infrastructure. Some key approaches that are outlined in the Treasury guidance um, are prioritizing supports for those hardest hit by the pandemic, um, and in particular, um, low income workers and communities as well as people of color that we know have been um, have been, you know, left out of um, a lot of programs and have faced long standing barriers well before the pandemic started. Um, Emphasizing to that point, reaching those who who have been left out. Um, it's also worth noting that there's no federal requirement that grantees ask about immigration status, um, and so making sure that um, that immigration status requirements, whether it's explicit or sort of a de facto um, limitation, for example, by requiring a driver's license or a social security number, ensuring that that um, that that is maintained at the state and local implementation is really key. Um, and then engaging constituents and communities in planning um, for how dollars are allocated and providing um, insights as to what your communities are experiencing so that they can um, guide state and local leaders um, as to where funding should go. So again, in terms of the timeline, this is multi-year funding. We have um, a few years, we have, yeah, so three years to allocate the dollars and then five years, about five years to spend the dollars. Some of these decisions have already been made. So um, Senate Bill 172, which was signed by the governor a couple of weeks ago includes um, appropriations for 29 issue specific federal grants. Um, and so what that did was basically um, allow state agencies to um, allocate the funds based on the federal guidance. Um, House Bill um, 947 includes broadband expansion and that utilizes um, some funds from the American Rescue Plan. And then House Bill 334 um, began as a job grants program bill. Um, and then I believe it was last week, um, there was a proposed committee substitute put forth that included a whole host of what would be really devastating tax cuts for North Carolina. And when they are fully implemented, it would um, reduce our tax revenue by over $2 billion. Um, currently, the fiscal note only takes us to a few years out. So we, we don't even know the full, the full scope of how harmful the impact would be. Um, those tax cuts were crafted in a way where they um, it would eliminate the corporate income tax along with um, with other tax changes, but they um, those changes do not start until 2024, and that was done intentionally because of um, the requirement that dollars be allocated by 2024. Um, so it intentionally sort of goes around um, the no net tax cut provision. Um, I know I'm right up against 15 minutes, but I just have like one or two more like really broad um, slides. So, um, you know, I've already kind of spoken about tax cuts. I think we sort of see this at the Budget and Tax Center as two key parallel processes. So encouraging um, bold ideas through the use of the American Rescue Plan dollars, as well as needing to push for a comprehensive general fund budget. Um, we have a, over $7 billion in unreserved cash sitting in our state's bank account. Um, we have a rainy day fund of $1.1 billion, and um, probably in the next week or two, we'll see an updated revenue forecast, although the one from February, um, you know, seemed like uh, we were better than expected in terms of our revenue growth during the pandemic. Um, so again, this just sort of uh, repeats what I've already said, which is that there's lots of local opportunities to engage, um, let elected leaders know about your priorities and what the needs are in communities. Um, and so with that, I will, there's my email address and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Awesome. Thank you so much, Susie. And it looks like our next presenter, the Matt Gross is here. So Matt, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Hey, thank you for having me. When I talked to Adam, he said, I'm going to come here to talk about the recovery plan and I should just focus on North Wilkesboro Speedway. So 
I've got 10 minutes on the racetrack money. I think that's what everybody wants to hear about. Um, no, so there's clearly quite a bit uh, that is in the governor's ARPA proposal. So just to make sure we're all looking at the same space, I'm gonna go ahead and share a link in the chat where folks can read the entire plan. It's very substantive. So I'm not gonna obviously go through everything, but I'm gonna hit on some of the highlights. So when we look at some of the HHS work within the governor's ARPA plan, it really breaks down into six categories. So the first category is contain the virus and end the pandemic, something I know that we're all incredibly anxious to, to do and, and cross the finish line with. And then that really looks at a couple of different pots of money. Um, the two of the bigger pots within the ARPA dollars. One is the vaccine money and the other one's testing and tracing. So looking at the vaccine money, what we'd be looking to do with that funding are to continue to make vaccine access easier. We want to continue to have smaller sites, mobile sites, homebound vaccine delivery, some mass sites when it when it's necessary and makes sense and would be logistically uh, uh, appropriate. Um, continue to do our outreach to historically marginalized populations, which we know some of that's been focused on vaccine hesitancy, but cr quite frankly, a lot of it's been around vaccine navigation, um, trying to help folks find access to the vaccine. Um, also looking to implement strategies to improve vaccine uptake. We've already started a little bit of this uh, in four counties. We've been um, uh, piloting some summer cash cards that we've given to both folks that come to get their first vaccine dose and also for people who drive folks to their first vaccine dose. And we've seen that be fairly successful. I, I've heard anecdotally one site that went from four people that came to get vaccinated a couple of weeks ago to 55 people last week. We're hearing stories about folks that have seen this and they're actually finding more people and driving them. So kind of that encouragement of, hey, find your neighbors, find your friends who haven't been vaccinated and bring them to a site is working. We're piloting that right now in um, Rowan, Mecklenburg, Guilford, and Rockingham counties. Uh, but so far, what we've seen initially is going well. We're getting some, UNC is uh, doing some uh, analysis on it so we can and really get a sense of how much is moving the needle. And I think we'll see some other incentive announcements coming in the near future as well, because we know that we're, we're kind of to that place where incentives are a, piece, a, a key piece of it. And listen, I, I get that. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but when I go to get my flu vaccine, you know, I tend to get it at uh, the grocery store down the street where I also get a $10 gift card on my groceries. So, you know, the more we can do with that to encourage folks to get vaccinated, the better. So that's sort of the first first area of work and two of the bigger buckets of money we're focused on are the, the, the vaccine and testing and tracing money. So the next area, I'm not gonna spend any, really any time here because of the audience, we're gonna, this is a, a more child focused meeting, but supporting aging adults in North Carolina, there's a lot of work there. So please take a look at, at the opportunities we have there. I'm gonna then go to supporting hard hit families, essential workers and communities. So one of the big, areas of here for funding and say somebody with an early childhood background, one of the most exciting areas is all of the money that's available in the early childhood space. So the good news is it really kind of breaks down to three broad buckets. And the first two were allocated in Senate Bill 172 that uh, got signed into law last week. So that's a little over $800 million for child care stabilization grants. And then also uh, there's about I think another $15 million in CCDF funds that pass through and we we have that in our possession so that's good so what's left in the child care space is there's an additional 500 million dollars to allocate from in uh, ccdf funds now one thing to keep in mind with this 500 million dollars that is 500 million dollars with a three-year spending fuse so whatever you do with that money you have to sort of budget it out for three years which becomes really important for things like say child care subsidy where it's a federal rule within ccdf that if you put a child into child care subsidy, that child has to continue to get subsidy for as long as they're eligible. So you you can't, you, you obviously couldn't say dump all the money into subsidy in one year because you get into then a huge budget crunch on the back end where we would, we would be out of compliance with the feds. So our proposal around the CCDF funds that are remaining really kind of fall into three buckets. One being subsidy, we know it's really important to continue to address the child care subsidy waiting list. So we're proposing putting about 215 million of that 500 towards child care subsidy. I will note that uh, Senate bill, I believe it's 116 that moved yesterday, which is now a back to work bill that includes the controversial provision of 
rejecting the enhanced unemployment benefits included spending 250 million out of that pot on childcare subsidy. Not entirely clear what the fate of that bill will be given the controversial uh, items that are in there. So anyway, pending that passing becoming a law, we still got the 500. So out of that 250 million to expand access with some of that really focusing on how we can get infants and toddlers into care. We know that's often one of the hardest and most critical populations to serve. Um, Another big area of focus with that money we'd like to do is increase the child care workforce pipeline and focus about 220 million of that on child care teacher recruitment and retention incentives. Um, we know this has been a big topic of discussion. It's one of the impetus behind Senate Bill 570. Um, in fact, a lot of the items that they put in 570 for us to report on are relying on this funding to, to accomplish in terms of teacher pay and retention bonus, both recruitment and retention uh, funding. There's also some money we'd like to include in there to build more support for family child care homes and also to uh, modernize the early childhood technology infrastructure, which was actually another important piece when you look at uh, the retention and recruitment of child care teachers. So one of the things that we know is despite the really just tragically low pay within child care, once folks enter the field, they are often stay in it, even if they switch centers. But right now, because all of that documentation is paper-based, if somebody works in a center, they want to move to a different center, let's say they move to a different county and they want to stay in childcare, they got to get their degrees again, they got to get all their certifications and present that. We want to get to where that is centrally, electronically located in a place where it's easy for if you are a teacher and you move from one childcare center to another, you can just kind of, you can just show them like your electronic record of what's already been um, documented by the state. So that, that will help make it easier for child care teachers to stay in the field. So those are the kind of the, the areas you want to be spending that CCDF money on. Again, it's the 500 million that still has to get allocated. We'll see what shakes out with um, uh, House Bill 116. If that does end up becoming law, then that's down to just 250 million where we clearly want to focus most of that on the recruitment and retention. Hopefully some of this tech work since what's in there now is the subsidy money. So continuing on to other areas of focus, uh, improving health equity is another big area of focus. And, and frankly, the good news with this is a lot of the money that you'll see laid out in the governor's proposal here is money that we were able to get um, from the December funding package. So a lot of this is, is in our hands already to go ahead and start doing this work. So some of the things we really wanna focus on in the health equity space um, are to support community-based and faith-based organizations to develop and implement strategies to advance health equity amongst historically marginalized populations. You know, I know this is an issue that so many of us have worked on for years and the, the pandemic has just shined a light on the need to do so much more in this space. Um, also wanna use this funding to create a more robust local health equity infrastructure with a focus on prevention. Also, we wanna use some of this money uh, for grants to improve housing and food security. Um, also some community-based child abuse prevention to focus on things like the cost of diapers, food, rent, utilities, and to address, you know, ACEs across the board, because we know that that can lead to such uh, negative outcomes, um, particularly among our, our really uh, strained communities. So uh, excited about the health equity work. I'd say from an advocacy standpoint, there's not as much to do legislatively there because we have a lot of the money, but certainly a lot of engagement opportunity for your organizations with DHHS as we implement this work. So a couple other areas that are in the budget, and I'm not going to touch on too deep because we're running short on time, strengthening the response to the mental health crisis. There's a fair amount of funding in there for that work. And then also a lot of money to upgrade our public health capacity and infrastructure. And one of the things I want to flag in there is that the governor set aside $35 million for lead abatement in child care and all and, and up. K-12 public schools, which is great and frankly dovetails really nicely with House Bill 272, which I know NC Child has been working on, we've been supportive of, and has now been calendared for a Senate Health Committee meeting on Wednesday. So hopefully that funding for lead abatement will uh, be approved by the General Assembly. And like I said, it pairs nicely with the bill that's moving. With that, I know that's a lot, and there's a lot there, as I see Michelle said, a lot of light reading that I put forward, but happy to answer any quick questions that came up about that or about the funding for North Wilkesboro Speedway or Rockingham Speedway or the local short tracks for Charlotte. I'm not gonna just maintain that to North Wilkesboro. So anyway, happy to answer any questions. Matt, thank you so much. Um, not only for the information, but the really funny jokes. Um, so next we're going to go to, Fawn, correct me if I'm wrong here. My notes say Vicky is next. I just wanna make sure I get the slide order right. 
I think that sounds great if Vicki's ready to go. Yeah. All right, y'all. Next up is Vicki. Take it away. Great. And Fawn, I wasn't sure if you would be sharing the slides or if I would. Do you happen to have them up on your computer? Yep. I'll pull it up. Okay, great. I just have one slide, y'all. Um, so we are so excited to see um, just unprecedented investments um, via the American Rescue Plan funds. And one of the areas that we're particularly excited about is lead, um, so environmental health. And y'all know that NC Child has been working on children's environmental health for a few years now. Um, and so we were excited to see the inclusion of an unprecedented, unprecedented $160 million investment um, to eliminate lead in the places where children learn and spend much of their days, so child care centers and public schools. And so specifically, 35 million of that 160 million would go towards testing and removing lead in children's drinking water at child care centers and schools. And another 125 million would go towards removing lead paint and asbestos in child care centers and schools. And I'm gonna specifically um, focus on lead since that is one of our major campaigns, but certainly asbestos continues to be um, a environmental health hazard in schools. And so we are so excited to see that included in this proposal. So what we know about lead um, is backed up by decades of research, right? We know that lead is toxic to the brain and the nervous system, and particularly among young kids, they, are, they more readily absorb lead and are in a critical life stage for brain development. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, and the EPA all agree that there's no safe level of lead exposure for kids. Um, and over the last several decades, our state has made really great progress in reducing childhood lead exposure. And we've come close to eliminating childhood exposure and lead exposure entirely. But we also know from the data that high pockets of exposure remain. And in particular, particular um, children of color and families um, in low-income communities uh, with older infrastructure are at higher risk of lead exposure. Um, so the good news is that in addition to this proposal, our state has already been taking steps to get the lead out of um, children's drinking water. And so the Clean Water for Carolina Kids program, which is being led by the North Carolina Division of Public Health and RTI International, is um, already um, implementing an effort to test and remove lead from drinking water at licensed child care centers. And um, based on that testing, we're finding that one in 10 child care centers have found lead above the state's hazard level for young kids. So we know that there is lead present and that it is um, endangering kids. And those who are finding these elevated lead levels are taking low cost solutions like installing a certified filter to protect hundreds of young kids from lead. So the governor's proposal would build on the testing that's currently happening um, and even use the same model that Clean Water for Carolina Kids is using. So the citizen science model, which has proven to be really effective, cost effective and successful and would empower our state educators um, to, you know, who are already showing up for kids in the classroom to also show up for kids um, health. And so this is really exciting. And um, in addition to this, the funds would also help develop a statewide database to, to better track um, testing and mitigation happening at child care centers and schools. So we're really excited, y'all. Um, if approved, these funds will help move our state so much closer to ending childhood lead poisoning once and for all. And that's a really big deal because we've been working on that for the last, you know, 50 plus years. Um, so that is what I have and happy to answer any questions later on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vicki. Lastly, we're going to turn it over to Elizabeth Byram. Elizabeth, take it away. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, and Fawn, do you mind sharing my one slide? Happy to. Perfect. Well, I'm just going to quickly go over um, some additional details and really um, look forward to any questions that folks have. Um, but I'm focusing on early education. We heard a lot from Matt about the sort of various buckets of money. Um, it really is a historic investment. We are so excited at NC Child about this billion dollar investment for early education in North Carolina. And so um, not to repeat a lot of what Matt shared, but it is a $1.3 billion um, investment of federal relief dollars from the American Rescue Plan, specifically for childcare. There are the two kind of main buckets, the stabilization grant program, 
which has already been received by the Division of Child Development. What we've heard is that they are still getting some final questions answered from their federal partners about how to implement that program. Um, but we think it's really important to spread the word to providers of all kinds that this program is available. Um, there will be an application process of some sort that we're waiting to learn more about um, and are really relying on advocates to help support providers in making sure they get these critical funds. Um, another thing about the stabilization grant program is that we're really working to make sure some of those funds are going to be designated for compensation. And so the federal government has um, sort of strongly recommended that providers are able to use those dollars directly to benefit teachers and increase teacher pay, um, provide benefits. And so we think that's really important as well to have sort of a criteria that the money is used that way. We know that providers are very interested in supporting their teachers and that we know that compensation has been a long-standing issue. So this is a great opportunity to kind of address that now and hopefully for the future. The second bucket, which is that 500 million is really focused more on subsidy expansion, supporting families. Um, and so again, we're really thinking about how can this be used now to address needs, but also increase our investment in the future for childcare. Um, I'll jump just to the bottom real quick, but you'll see sort of our, our quick top priorities, again, are a three-prong approach. We're thinking about supporting teachers, increasing compensation and benefits, knowing that they are so committed to children and families and they deserve to be treated that way and receive a living wage expanding subsidy assistance. That's both expanding slots as we saw in the governor's proposal um, for ARP, which we're excited about, but also thinking about expanding eligibility. Um, right now, we know that some families um, kind of experience a what we call a benefit cliff or they're basically, they lose their subsidy eligibility and are still not able to necessarily afford care. And so thinking about, can we use some of this investment to really serve more families and also increase the, the families that are eligible for these funds? Um, and then the last thing, which is really around programs, supporting programs and making sure they're sustainable and are able to serve their communities, it's specifically around the rates. Um, so this is reflected in House Bill 574, but we're really thinking about using federal dollars as a bridge investment to this long-term need to increase our rates, the reimbursement that programs receive for families that have children on subsidy. Um, and so again, I think the message here is that we have an opportunity with $1.3 billion to use that money for these priorities. And we also need state investment as well. And so to make these recurring investments, so it's really sort of trying to get this in both kind of budgets, if you will, pots of money, and why not use this incredible opportunity to build that bridge to long-term investment. Um, one thing that I had up there, which is a little bit in the weeds, but it, we did have an additional bucket of money, which is about $16 million. I think Matt touched on this as well. That's actually a mandatory increase to our federal um, allocation of the block grant that we get every year. So that will be a, that will be a permanent increase. Um, and so looking forward to having, you know, permanently some more money in addition to kind of this money that we get to use over the next three years. Um, so that's kind of my high level summary. I'm happy to take any questions. I wanna make sure we have time to get questions from folks for all our speakers. All right, so now we're gonna move into the question and answer portion. Uh, so Fawn, if you wanna, are, are you taking this on or is it Adam? I can read out questions. Um, I, there is definitely a question in the chat from Melissa Johnson, and this might be a good question for Matt about what kinds of resources might be directed towards children with special needs, mental health consultation and childcare or early intervention. Y'all, I'm not 100% sure that Matt is still on the on the Zoom. I could be wrong, but I think I saw him leave. All right, that's okay. Um, as far as uh, mental health consultation and childcare early intervention, Elizabeth, you want to handle that one? Yes, and I will say that I'm happy to follow up with some more resources as I dig through the um, budget. I, in terms of childcare, we have not seen a specific um, proposal for supporting kind of mental health and early intervention. But I do know, and I don't want to misspeak, that there was some additional funds to do that. Um, and so I can follow up after I look through and maybe we can get Matt to clarify. Um, but I don't think it was specific within childcare, but more broadly investing in early intervention. And Susie, do you want to jump in on that one too? I see you in the chat. Sure. Yeah. I just put uh, the 
I can think more thoroughly about this, but the first thing that comes to mind is the um, Individuals um, with Disabilities Education Act grants. Um, there's sort of three components to that, um, and I'm happy to follow up um, by email if there are additional questions. Great. Um, there's a question in the chat from Jess. Do we have a sense of how much local communities will be able to determine how community based prevention funds can be used? And who wants to jump on that one? This is Adam. I don't know the exact answer to that, but I will say just from what I've been reading and seeing as far as decision making processes at the local level and Susie I'm sure could probably jump in here. It seems to be fairly wide open at this point, like there was a discussion in Guilford County last week, for example, where it was kind of like, hey, we've got $100 million and local funds coming down the line through through ARP or what have you. Here are some parameters, but we really don't have this figured out as of yet. And I think that that type scenario is going to be repeating itself across the state of North Carolina. And I know, Philip, you had asked a question, too, about, you know, how do we know how to advocate at the county level or something like that? Again, I don't know the exact answers to that, but I think it's real important that we try to find that out and figure out a clear path for advocacy for folks to go to their county commissioners or whatever the case may be to say, look, these are some needs we have and to know the right time to interject in that process, et cetera, just like we're trying to do at the state level. Yeah, and so we at BTC have done a lot of work with um, folks in, you know, out in communities to help them understand. I, I think part of the challenge with the local processes is that um, local budgets are all on different timelines. You know, every county has its own timeline and process, every city, every municipality. So um, it's hard to kind of um, describe it at a high level um, because it really, is, you know, there's some, there are some um, common themes and strategies that can be used. But I think the first big thing is understanding um, the, the timelines that each county and municipality operates under, um, you know, th that would be my starting suggestion, but, um, we, I'm, I'm, I would be really actually happy to connect with folks, whether that's in, um, in this space in the future or, um, you know, a separate follow-up meeting, because there's a whole lot more to be said about that and how folks can plug in, um, but with respect to the community-based prevention funds, Jess, I'm not sure if you're referring to the child welfare specific funds, but while like the treasury guidance is extremely broad, the issue specific funding um, had like their specific agencies have guidance around how those can be um, allocated, um, whether that's a longstanding uh, federal grant um, like the, like I believe the community-based prevention funds are, um, or you know, a new uh, a new program that has been created um, in response to COVID. So that's not that's not an answer to your question, but it sort of depends on what what funding stream you're looking to tap into. Um, David Hunt has a great question about whether there's a requirement for citizen participation in any of these programs. There's not a requirement, but it's, um, I forget the exact language in the treasury guidance, but it says that it's like strongly encouraged. <laughs> Great, I have a question related to all of this, sort of thinking about you know how to tap into that and how to participate. It feels like from what you all are describing that there are several sets of decision makers about how this money is gonna be spent. And I wonder if somebody could just step us through that. Like who's the decision maker for which buckets of money just to help people think about how to plug in and who to target. I'm happy to start from the childcare lens, um, which is sort of my wheelhouse. And then I'd love for anyone else to jump in. Um, very good question. I have to check myself every day to make sure I know who I'm talking to about which um, item, but right now, given the childcare money, I know someone had a question about um, in the chat about when local communities will see that money specifically. Um, we're at the point when it comes to the stabilization grants, that now is in the hands of the Division for Child Development. 
And so any input or feedback or advocacy about how that program will be administered should go to um, the Division of Child Development, which Ariel Ford is the director there. And um, you know, they, I think, are very open to hearing from providers and community members about making sure that money gets out the door in an equitable way. Um, in terms of the other part of the child care dollars, the um, child care assistance, 500 million, that still has to be fully appropriated through the General Assembly. So there is still an opportunity to weigh in with the General Assembly about what that money will be allocated for. Um, back at our previous federal package, we saw some restrictions put into place on that same sort of pot of money from the prior um, coronavirus relief package. And so I think it's really important for folks, um, if you're advocating on childcare and early education, to make sure that the issues you care about um, get to the legislators that are going to be making decisions about that money, um, particularly talking about the needs that communities still have and really bringing in a provider, a parent perspective. Really, those perspectives are so important. Um, while I'm on this topic, I'm going to go ahead and drop a link to our action alert that we have specifically for the American Rescue Plan money for childcare. If you'd like to use that as a way to reach out and share um, what's important to you about those buckets of money. And I think uh, what Elizabeth just outlined really speaks to sort of <laughs> the way that all the money is operating, where the short answer is that it depends. Um, the issue specific fund, so generally speaking, um, this is not true in every instance, but generally speaking, uh, like the issue specific funds, so childcare, um, child abuse state grants, um, I'm looking at the list, uh, like ID, um, IDEA grants, um, you know, maternal, infant, and child home visiting, that was also um, part of the American Rescue Plan. Um, generally speaking, agency, it's now with agencies to decide how to spend those dollars within either the requirements in the American Rescue Plan um, or requirements um, of the federal agencies. And so a lot of those are administered by um, the federal HHS um, department. Um, what I mentioned about the, the $5.4 billion coming to the state, all of that money, uh, the, the decisions about where that money goes will be made by the General Assembly but still some of those, um, like there will, there will be money earmarked for a specific purpose. Um, how, how specific the purpose is, is up to the General Assembly to decide, but a lot of that will still ultimately be administered by state agencies. So I know that's not, <laughs> that's not um, an ideal answer, but um, it's, it's both. Um, quick follow up, uh, just not that this would ever happen, but what if there was disagreement on th that legislation, for example, that funding, and it became like a partisan breakdown? Is that in that legislation? It, I'm assuming it would be subject to veto and having all that normal processes, if I'm correct about that. Then what would the feds do? I mean, is there some trigger to allocate the money or what would happen then? I think if it doesn't meet the deadline, like the 20 December 31st, 2024 deadline to be allocated, we would lose it. But the, to the finer points of your question, I'm, I'm not sure I would need to look more into um, what would happen, you know, if we like, break the rules or if there's disagreement or, you know, some kind of um, deadlock situation where the money doesn't actually get allocated. But that um, December 2024 deadline is really, really key. So I just want to summarize for my own thinking, because this has been so helpful, y'all. So when we're talking about the state legislature, we're talking about the same budget writers that can't agree on a basic number for the state budget right now, right? They're the ones who have to come to agreement about all these billions of dollars. And then if they do their job, it goes to state agencies who will decide the finer points and we can engage with them at that level. And then we've also got our county commissions in pretty much every county getting money coming in and figuring out what to do with it. So all those places are where everybody on this call should be plugging in. Is that kind of the, that's the bottom line there? Yes, and just 
not to make it even more complicated, but I think we would also, because of what they did last year, I think there's also some expectation that the state will also allocate money to local governments directly. And so the, you know, I mentioned like the really broad flexibility within the treasury guidance, but um, it would be the general assembly could, um, could impose other requirements um, on local governments, whether that's around eligibility for who can receive money or um, how a program has to be structured for folks to apply for, for money. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, we have a question from Philip Belcher. How do we find out how much money will be going to each county? Yeah, so I can share my fact sheet in the chat, which includes a link to the treasury guidance, um, but it includes a table of money going to um, a handful of metropolitan cities in North Carolina and the breakdown across all 100 counties. I can share that now. Thanks. Um, I may have missed something. I don't think I see any other questions in the chat. Just want to lift up that we are definitely seeing some folks really concerned about sort of the lack of attention on um, kids with special needs and families with special health care needs who have really struggled during COVID. Um, and we're already underfunded before that. So um, I see Melissa dropped her email into the chat. If folks want to connect around that, um, I will encourage you to take the survey that we shared um, that Tiffany talked about earlier, and I'll drop the link in the chat right now. We want to know what your priorities are for the American Rescue Plan funds so that as NC Child is advocating at the legislature and the state agencies that we know what y'all are looking for and can connect with you about that. So that survey link is back in the chat. And I think that's it for questions, unless more folks um, have other questions they want to ask in the chat. Can I, one more question, I'm sorry, I'm just a participant like everybody else trying to learn something. The, and I, and Susie, and maybe this, you know, uh, offline or somebody else could answer. I'm very concerned, you know, going back to all of this, I'm very concerned that a lot of people, and hopefully I'm wrong, who are eligible for these increased child tax credit monies that are supposed to be hitting people's bank accounts starting in July are not going to receive them because they have not filed their taxes and don't understand how to, do you have any, you know, do you have any insight or perspective, like what num what type of numbers of people are we talking about that might be left out, et cetera? It's a very good question. I don't have those data at my fingertips, um, you know, I think once we start talking about who's who's not receiving something, it gets a little bit dicey. It's always easier to measure who is getting something. Um, but I will uh, try to get my hands on some numbers for you. Excellent. Any other questions? All right, um, we wanted to leave a little room for announcements. So if anybody has any announcements they'd like to share, now is your time. Bueller, Bueller. All right, well, I'm gonna take the silence. Um, and give you guys three minutes back on your day. So happy Friday and thank you so much for joining us today and be on the lookout for the email version um, of, the, of this actual recording. Thanks so much, y'all.